Good morning and welcome to the Webinar Talk Show. I'm Liz Green. And I'm Tom Singer. Thank you so much for joining us here on these daily broadcasts where we're trying to bring to you some really interesting people in a more engaging way than just a talking head over a PowerPoint. Eliz and I realized when this whole stay at home crisis began that there were a lot of webinars and people were getting webinar fatigue pretty quick and that yes. webinars could be more interesting. So thanks for joining and us. And should be more interesting. And should be. Absolutely. And Tom and I have been ahead of the curve on this. We've been doing this sort of work for just about six years. And I'm excited because we have a guest today that's ahead of the curve on delivering digital content, very important digital content that works. And we could not be more excited because- I'm so excited. I'm so excited. Lori Guest is one of my favorite people. Uh, well, Lori Guest is one of my favorite people, but she's also one of my favorite speaker friends. So welcome to the webinar talk show, Lori Guest. Hey, Lori. Hey, guys. All right, I'm starting out with a complaint. I know people come on and say, I'm so happy to be here, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. No, we're going right to it. I have a complaint. My pre-show notes say that I'm supposed to engage with you for about 20 minutes, and I'm yeah. wondering when have I ever talked to either of you for only 20 minutes? <laughs> really? How are we going to do this, people? How are we? How can we keep our customers happy and satisfied in twenty-minute blocks? I just don't think it can be done. But this I'm, could uh, be the longest episode of the webinar talk yeah, show yeah. ever. All day. All right. Well, there's no no rule that says we can't continue to talk after we turn the broadcast Fair off. Fair enough. Fair enough. So here's the thing: you are an expert in customer service. How did you become an expert? in customer service? <laughs> well, it certainly wasn't a childhood dream, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I can just picture you like, in, I can picture you in third oh, grade. I want to be a customer service expert. Yeah, exactly. Well, the way it started is I have a healthcare background and uh, mm -hmm. through several changes in career, I ended up in ophthalmology, actually. I worked for a regionally well-known eye surgery center and we were trend centers in our industry and we were doing things that others were not doing at the time. And I was there about 18 years and we were just dedicated to how we built up internal teams, how we marketed to our key referral sources and all of a sudden other industries started noticing and one day they called up my doctor employer and said hey we'd love for somebody on your team to come and teach us your secrets. My doctor looked around, you can imagine this, he looked around and goes Lori you like to talk, you go. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. That's how I became a speaker. And I didn't. I did it for a couple of years. A dual career worked for him, and then mm -hmm. spoke on the side. And then one day, I was at a conference where I was supposed to be the featured keynoter. You guys know how that feels—the featured yes. keynoter. And this is before I ever knew that professional speaking was a thing, because I wasn't getting paid. It was just part of my job. And uh, the speaker before me had people on the edge of their seats, and they were laughing and crying and lining up to buy her books. And I knew she'd been paid to be there, and I was so puzzled by all that. So I went up afterwards, and I said to her, uh, you do this for a living? And, sh and she said, I do. And I said, I think I want to do what you do. And uh, she said, well, I'm the incoming president of something called the National Speakers Association. Let me show you the way. And that was the one and only Glenna Salisbury. So oh my goodness. My a legend. In one day running, and when I say my whole life, I'm not exaggerating. The way we run our household, the way we receive our income, uh, the friends that I've met, the friends that mm -hmm. I have today, most of them are all connected somehow to the speaking world. So Glenna changed my life. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and that's not an unusual story for our association. No. That is, that is something in our association we call the Cavett spirit. It is, you know, reaching out your hand and saying, I know the way, come with me, uh, like mm -hmm. Lena did for you. Uh, yeah. And you have done for so ever many in return. So. She did it for me. It's a it's a pay it forward. So so when it came Excellent. to the customer service piece, that you know they always teach us speak what you know, speak what mm -hmm. you love, right? Those are the two things. Yeah. And there's other things that I love that nobody would pay to hear about. And so <laughs> <laughs> and so I decided that customer service made sense. And it really is a career that I believe can sustain this recession or whatever it is that we're going to be facing on the backside of this, because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether you have essential services right now and you are just overloaded with customers 
hours, or if you are on what I call the long runway, it's going to be a while mm -hmm. before you're back to work. What all of, and all the people in between, what they have in common is we still need great service. We need to take care of what I call your guest. So whether it's your patient, your patron, your customer, your client, around here, we call them all a guest. So you gotta is it, take isn't care that of kind of interesting that your name is Lori Guest and you became a customer service speaker talking about how you treat your guests? Yes, actually, some women seek a husband that meets other needs. I saw <laughs> one that his last name is what I want to be. And it took me a long time because it's not even that common of a name. If I'd known it was going to work out that way, I should have been looking for Tom Skinny, but I didn't find him. <laughs> Outstanding. Use that joke, people. <laughs> uh, that so, is outstanding. So, Lori, you, you have really spent a career focusing, teaching people this whole idea of customer service. And, you know, this isn't new. We've talked about customer service for a long time. Why are companies still dropping the ball? Gosh, what a great question. I've been doing this for over 22 years in my own company and 18 years before that. Yes, that makes me mm -hmm. old. And so really my entire adult life has been on this topic and I am puzzled with the same question. You would think that good service would be common sense. Wouldn't you? And, and even and I see people in the front row that are forced to go to customer service training and they're kind of sitting here like this, you know, tell me something I don't. They've got the look of, you know, I know all this stuff already, right? Yeah. And isn't it just common sense? Mm -hmm. And what I push back on is common is uncommon because mm -hmm. get this, when you really think about it, the way we get our common sense is in five key places and none of us share the same five things. Here they are. Hmm. the family in which you were raised in. Mm -hmm. How did your family treat other people? That became your early example. Were they treating everybody nice or were you in a different household? So the house and where you, you were raised. The era in which you were born. So that's for all those of our pals that speak on generational differences. Mm -hmm. That's critical. The way that an 18-year-old's common sense is with a customer today is not the same as, as somebody who might be in their 50s or 60s, where everybody mm -hmm. was polite to each other for the most part. So when you were born, you're at your uh, basic personality. The three of us are majorly extroverted people. We can talk to anybody about anything at any time. Yeah, what? yeah, we are. <laughs> but not everybody you hire is like that. And some of them, you're pulling the words out of them for them mm -hmm. to communicate with your guests. The next one is, where did you used to work? So uh. Tom, if you and I worked right next to each other at the bank, and you were a loan officer who wasn't very kind to our clients and, and you were short with them and you just didn't believe in great service, you thought our product was all that matters, then I would take you as my example because they put my desk right next to yours, you become mm. an example. And then the last piece is where do you work now? Who are you standing next to now? It, it, we uh, soak up the environment around us, which is why our organization believes so hard that everybody, everybody on the team is showtime in the customer service so that it becomes seamless. So those things cannot be common to everybody because the five areas are also different for each and every one of us. And you know, we often forget, but I mean, it's been taught for a long time that we really are the sum of those people who we hang around with. So where you work right. before and where you work now and their attitude really does rub off on us. And, and I don't think I ever thought about that from a customer service standpoint, that's fascinating. Well, think about how often, you know, that the person who isn't doing well at their position with customer service is going to be relieved from their duties. They just don't know it yet. And what we do before mm. we relieve them from the duties is we hire their replacement and we put them right next to them to train them. And I always use the metaphor of cancer because it really is the perfect metaphor. That bad attitude person is like a cancerous cell or tumor mm. in your organization. And you guys all know that when we take out a tumor, we keep cutting till we get to clean margins, right? You gotta right. keep going to you. Well, that may mean I can pluck out that one person and he lives, slides you into her or his position. And as long as the margins are clean, you can start up fresh. But if I bring right. you in and put you right next to that tumor and let you model after them for two weeks, the mold is already set. And now I have to right. undo all that after I take the tumor out. It doesn't make any sense. Well, and I see that a lot in terms of a lot of my experiences with nonprofit mm -hmm. in the past and the attitude about the people either that they're serving or the donors. And if you get somebody who really finds either one of those groups annoying, yeah, 
<laughs> it's, yeah. it's really hard not to adopt that same attitude mm -hmm. when it's just constantly coming at you. That's really smart. Mm -hmm. hmm. Really smart. So do we have to change everything in customer mm -hmm. service to make a difference? I don't think I've ever been asked that question before. Let me think about that for a second. Um, I don't know that I've ever worked with an organization that had to change everything mm -hmm. unless the person who started the company is where the change is needed. <laughs> so you grow okay. what you plant. Yeah. Yes. So if the core seed is where the negative or the poor attention to detail or whatever the issues are, if that's where it originated, then it's really hard to not change everything. And you can't change everything by, you know, you're not going to remove the guy who owns the place, right? And right. so, no, I, I, the first thing that I do if I'm asked to help an organization is figure out what is going right. And uh, mm -hmm. as you guys know, but I'll tell the people who are listening, we've spent 15 years secret shopping. And so we do two to three companies a year that ask us to do it. And then a lot of little shops in between. And so I have, you know, a decade and a half of data of what people do right and where they're missing the boat. And I love to focus in on where's the missed opportunity. But when it's time for me to report out to you my findings, I can't go straight to missed opportunities, right? It's the same way right. as when we discipline people. We start with here's where you're, you're, you've got it going on. Here's the things that you're doing right. And I've learned over time that I have to really dig for those and look for those because I need to give you some compliments on the front end. What it's done for me is open my eyes to, you know what, even though they've got 10 things I want to change, they got this one golden nugget over here that we need to fan a little bit. We need to get that blazing mm -hmm. over here because they've got this one thing. And all it takes is the one thing to get going. So in today's world with uh, sort of everybody moving home and working from home, <laughs> how, is, how is this crisis impacting customer service for most companies? Yeah, that's, I was just interviewed uh, for a, a newspaper article the other day on this topic. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest challenge is, is that not every home environment is set up the way the three of us are set up right now. I am yeah. in a home office and it's already set to go. We have the technology because as you guys said, we've been doing this for years. So I have the technology, all the systems are in place. We can go live mm -hmm. almost anytime you know, snap your fingers. Right. But when I interviewed somebody, actually a member of the headquarters of our association, I interviewed mm -hmm. her ahead of time for this, this interview I was going to give. And I asked her, what is the most challenging thing? And she said that my desk is now my kitchen table. And I have to move everything off. And she lives in an apartment, I think, or a condo or something. It's not a huge house. She's a single person. And so she lives in a small square foot and she has to clear everything away to eat, right? And then put it all back. And she goes, what I miss most is my desk, my thing mm -hmm. where I have stuff. And so this becomes our challenge. If you're expected to hop on the phone and deliver great service, but you don't have the tools you normally have. What I think we have to be thinking about is this short-term issue that we just got to power through, or is any of this going to change to a more new normal? And now mm -hmm. is the time to start setting up your environment to make it as conducive to service as possible. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the questions I think people need to be asking themselves at home. If it's short term, another week, another two weeks, you power through, you just get through right. the best you can. But if you're looking at that medium to long runway re-entry, you really might get serious about how do you change things for yourself? Is there a third place you can go that is still considered sequestered? And some people are doing that. They're having mm -hmm. that rented third office space where they can go, but it still is on lockdown. So things like that. Mm -hmm. That's really smart. Now, I know you're working on something new, the Tencent Decision. Yeah. That's I find book. this really interesting. Can you give us a little bit of that? Yeah, I sure can. And, and actually not even working on it is done and out there. It's, it's available. I should have grabbed a copy to put up in front of you and show you. But my new book is called The Tencent Decision, How Small Change Pays Off Big. And this is the part I'm excited about with the book. It is actually a flip book. You know what? I am going to grab it. Can I grab it? Can I do that? Yeah, real absolutely. You can grab it. Right. absolutely. So you talk amongst yourselves and I'll be right back. Awesome. Okay. No, I'm so glad you asked her this question because I think this concept of what she's talking about, about how the small changes make the big difference. I okay, think it's I'm so back. true, so here's true the deal. for big companies and solopreneurs. Yeah, absolutely. So, here, so here's the front of the book. And if you're a team person, you're a front line, you read it from the front cover to the middle. Now get ready. You flip <gasps> it. And if you're a leader, you read it from the back cover to the middle. So half the book is upside down. And so what I say is I believe in an integrated approach to customer service. So everybody should read the whole book. 
But I found when I was writing it, you guys know that when we write stuff, they tell us to have an avatar, to write to somebody specific, right? And put that, give that person a personality and a name and a position. And when I was writing the book, I wasn't doing that. And I kept putting, whether you're frontline or a leader, whether you're a, a receptionist or an owner, you know, I was I kept doing, and all of a sudden I thought, boy, I am not clear on who I'm writing to. And uh, one of my mastermind buddies suggested that I do a flip book. And then I divide it in half. And write to one group on one side and one on the other. And oh my gosh, the clarity it gave. Because for example, there's some ideas that as a leader, you're not the one who's going to have to deal with it. The proper right. way to greet a customer, how to deal with the angry customer. Those are not things in general that you as the owner have to deal with. So that's on the frontline side, especially the dealing with the angry. We're going to have a lot of that out there. Yeah. A lot of angry people because fear and anger are causing emotions. So all this right. fear is coming up and they're going to lash out at all the frontline people. I have a lot of empathy for those people. Now on the flip side, my leaders are the ones who can control things like how are we packaging things? What are we naming it? How are we yeah. selling it? How are we pricing it? My frontline person doesn't have any control over that. So once I divided who I was talking to, the book really came into shape. And so I'm, I'm very excited about the product. And there is a video series that goes with it and matches up with all the chapters. And so, uh, yeah, this stuff was all in place before this hit. So my timing happened to be pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty good this time around. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you bring up that there's a video series that go with it. And that's one of the things we talked about in, in the introduction right. of you is that long before everybody out there who does, does any type of training or speaking became a virtual expert, yes. you already were doing like online training and having video series. So can we talk about what got you into to doing this years ago? Sure. Well, I really resisted the idea of being a consultant and coach. I tried it in the early mm. stages and I just honestly don't feel I had the proper training that made me a good coach because I kept people's, um, what do you call that? The, the responsibility. If I coach you guys and I give you assignments to do, if you didn't get them done by the next time we met, I was kind of helping you along, you know, almost like mm. the parent helping the kid get through the term paper. Right. So <laughs> yeah. I just don't think I was, and I took your problems and made them mine. And I just didn't feel I was a very effective coach. So I I stopped doing that probably uh, over 10 years ago. I stopped doing any kind of deep dive consulting. But what I found was when I do a keynote and leave, if I've done a good job, people would like me to leave a piece of me behind. Mm -hmm. 45 minutes of what I have to say is not enough to rock your world, right? <laughs> I, can, I can rock your moment, but I can't rock your business if you're only going to take me in 45 minute increments. So I realized there has to be a way to leave a little, a little bit of Lori behind and where can they go to get more? And you kind of listen to your customers. And this is true for the people listening to this that are outside our field. Right now is the perfect time to open up your ears and listen to what is your customer asking you for? Boy, I sure wish you would fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I just see this all the time where we miss the boat because we didn't listen to what the customer wanted us to do. And in my case, I had customers saying, boy, I sure wish there was a place I could go buy more of your stuff. And so that's how mm -hmm. I ended up doing it. And, and, I, and I did it in a, what I thought was a creative way. There's a, two modules, 30 videos total, me talking to your team in very short increments. Think of it like staff meetings mm -hmm. in a box. But I felt like that's great, but I want more. So I interviewed 30 different experts about a half hour each that matches each one of the titles. Oh, so if I'm smart. talking to you for 20 minutes about dealing with the angry customer, we then have another 30 minute interview, very similar to this on Zoom face to face, where I'm doing a deep dive with somebody who has even more to add or a different angle from my views. And I think that's what really gave it a lot of its meat. It also has a 126 page curriculum with it. And mm -hmm. uh, so that you can use it for staff discussions. There's some exercises in there. People get really jazzed about the curriculum side. So in answer to your question, why did I get started? Because I didn't want to be a deep dive consultant, but I knew I had mm -hmm. content that mattered and I wanted to give it in bite-sized pieces that was easy to digest. Well, because you were listening to your customers. Right. Ultimately. Yeah. And I think that's a message we should be taking away from this conversation is how are we listening to our customers in order to create things that didn't exist before because the situation didn't exist before. And, and I think we probably are not going back to exactly how things were before we all were quarantined. Right. I, my personal belief, it's going to be similar to the 9-11 situation. Did we mm -hmm. fly again? Yes. Did we ever fly the same? No. 
right? Now, as yeah. you go through TSA, it's totally different. In fact, when I watch old TV shows and people are doing their cheerful goodbye at the gate, you know, we'll <laughs> never it. have a cheerful, unless you buy a ticket to get in the other yeah. side, we're never going to have, it'll never be the same. And I think that- Or rushing you know, to, yeah. you know, get them before they get on the plane. Yeah, that's not going to happen. No, they're going to have to completely change that in all the upcoming movies, right? <laughs> um, but I do think all kidding aside is that I, I feel where sometimes people miss the boat with service, bringing it back full circle, is mm -hmm. the basic people generally get. Now, I'm not saying their people mm. do it. Knowing and doing are two different things, right? <laughs> yes. All right. So just because they know it doesn't mean they're doing it, but they do get it. The part mm. that I feel people miss, the missed opportunity, are all the things you could be doing, but you're not. Mm. So Lori, let's, let's leave people with a couple of things that they can implement. If they're watching this and they know that they could up their customer service game, no matter what they do for a living, what are a few things that everyone can do starting today just to be that much better? The very mo most important thing I talk about all the time is word choice, word selection. Mm -hmm. So I would like people to really sit down as a team and make a list of the top five, 10, 15 things that you know you're going to be hit with when you're open for business. What are people going to be saying to you very specific to your location or to your industry? And then work together as a team to give the response to that that is positive, that is not focused on the negative energies of what we've been going through and is just zeroed right in. So I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. There is a local restaurant that um, we try and uh, buy once a week locally and carry out just to keep our homegrown mom and pop places still going, right? So I went yeah. into this local place to buy his food and he was so appreciative of us being there. That's number one, that's really good, right? But number two, he said to me, hey, as soon as we're open, I want to see you sitting right there. He didn't say, oh, it's been so tough for us and we're really struggling to keep the lights on. I mean, he didn't put us in this cloud bubble. He yeah. actually kind of made me look at the chair he'd like to see me sitting in when they're open again. That's a great phrase. He could take it one step further and say, hey, you know what we're really excited about? The one thing this downtime gave us was a chance to rearrange our menu. So I printed off a copy for you. Here's what the new menu is going to look like as soon as we open again. Do you want to give me your email and I'll pop you a note when we're open in case you don't see our ads? Oh, like, so again, smart. Those are the things yeah. I want people thinking about is that makes me excited to go back. And he's one of the first restaurants we will go to when we get the all clear. That's how I'd like people thinking. Hmm. Well, and I think the, the letting people know that you're open. Right. That's a struggle. Friday nights are our takeout night. Mm -hmm. um, we try to, to choose the restaurants that we want to stay in business. What, so what we are you go having out. tonight? Yeah, what are you going to really? have tonight? <laughs> So we have a favorite restaurant called the uh, Cat Lulu, Lulu Cafe, and it's a it's a small restaurant. It's grown over time, but we've been big fans for a long time. And they have a pretty varied uh, menu, and they have vegetarian options, which is good because one of our daughters is vegetarian. They did a nice job of letting us know that they were still open. Yeah, because it's very hard to figure out who's open right now. Well, I think you bring up an interesting point. We all believe that what we're doing, people are aware, mm -hmm. you know, that people know what is going on. So it'd be like, imagine if I said to you guys today, oh, guys, didn't you know that I was doing the da 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 da? Well, how would right. you know? Like, you right. just, when people say, like, like, everybody knows what else, what others are doing. I think that's an, uh, a foolish thing to do. I think it's better to put the post, to send out the mailer, however they're going to let people know. If nothing else, it's the big sandwich board on the side of the road that says, opening tomorrow, we're back, you know? Yeah. And, and I love creativity, too. Some of the things I've seen, I think, is so clever. Our local salon, uh, which, of course, is closed, they had ball caps made, and they have their logo on it. And it says, uh, make America beautiful again. And there's a hashtag in front of it. And they're sending it out to their clients um, as, as a way to keep advertising for them, just oh, waiting that's for smart. the doors to open. And I saw in Des Moines, there's a um, college hunks, move your junk. And I'm on their mailing list because we used them one time to move one of our kids out. And so I get their stuff and they had the most creative ad that came through on social media yesterday. It says all the things that are closed. There's like four lines of things that are closed. And then their logo. And it says, not us. We ride at dawn. Like that's right. And it's like a cartoon of a college mom, you know. And I mean, this is creativity where I kind of laugh to myself and think, you know, they're the next in line for a very short runway is because it's right. not essential. But if somebody needs to be moving for whatever their reason is, they become really close to essential. So they have a right. short runway, they need to get ready right away. 
That's really smart. And I think we've talked a lot this week about how all of the television ads look the same right now. Yeah, they do. It's all, it's all healthcare workers and first responders and thank you. And, and there's piano, nothing wrong. Piano music in the background. If you hear yeah. an ad with piano music, you it's know me. it's a company talking about COVID. Yeah. Right. Um, which there's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't make them stand out anymore because now everybody's doing it. The first couple were like, oh, that's yeah. really great. Yeah, yeah. How do you guys feel about the idea that, and I'm curious if you agree or disagree, mm -hmm. I've been advising clients that when you're coming out of this, at some point pretty quick, you stop referencing COVID. You move yeah. on with fresh start. I really feel like when we get an all clear, whenever that is, it feels like January 1st to me. You could do the same behavior on December 1st that you do on Jan 1st, but there's something about turning the calendar that's like a clean slate. And right. I've been saying that disruption is a perfect time to reset your service levels. But I don't mm. think we should keep coming back and referencing this time period once we're out of it. Do you guys agree or disagree with that? So I agree. I noticed early on, like five weeks ago, that everything in my inbox was totaled was titled covid or coronavirus and yeah. it was like the local pet store sent something about check the cdc site and wash your hands and my thought was i don't need a pet store i don't even have a pet store. <laughs> i don't need them telling me to wash my hands so i definitely think that as we move forward for a lot of us if you're if you're in the healthcare space or you sell something that helps keep people safe yeah i think you can keep mentioning it but as a professional speaker and a, and a trainer you know, I don't know that that's my tagline in, in my emails to my clients because that's I'm not an expert. I don't speak on that. I talk about how can you get your people more engaged. It's not so much about this as it's about moving forward with humanity and with that human right. focus. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I always say that creativity plus humor equals connection. If you are in a field <laughs> where you can use some humor, then please do. So I work a lot in uh, park and rec. And so when they open up their gyms again, you know, mm -hmm. I think that they should put signs on the scales that say, we have reset these five pounds less, go easy on yourself, <laughs> right? I mean, they should do, you know, uh, did you miss us or did you miss the machines? You know, there's all these oh, things yeah. that bring, bring humor into place. I think that they should um, put uh, clothing hanging on all of the treadmills to say, look, our machines look like yours at home, right? I mean, they have all these different ways they can bring, and in that field, you can do it. But like you said, in healthcare, there's nothing funny. And that would be, be a great, healthcare, that would be a mistake. That would be right. a great right. ad for a gym. I hope yeah. somebody is watching this and shares that with their <laughs> gym just to drape everything and just put it all over social media saying, look, our machines look like yours. Yeah. That would be killer. The one other thing I would recommend for people who are listening to this that are still in the middle of shutdown, I really mm -hmm. encourage people to pay attention to your autoresponder on email. I get mm -hmm. a lot of those and they all say the same thing. You know, they basically say, I'm out of the office until further notice. Now, our fellow colleague, Neen James, is one of the very best at doing this. She's a mm -hmm. fellow speaker who changes her outbound every day, and it is so clever. I want to send her an email every day just to find out what her <laughs> thing says, because she just, she makes me want to do business with her because of the creativity. Mm -hmm. And I've taken that idea, have not used it for myself the way I should, but I definitely am advising that other people think about, what do you want that message to say going back out? And is there a place that you can use some creativity. You know, I may not be sitting at my desk right now, but I sure hope you're doing the push-ups because I'll be watching for you come June 1 or whatever that message is going to be. Right. And let's get creative. And I think we're going to start getting to the time period where the more we use humor that's responsible, the more that will be accepted because don't we all need it? We're tired. We need the yes. Humor. Yeah, yeah, I think people, I think when we get back to live events, there's going to be two things that are going to be really important. And I think that is a sense of whether it's humor or, or lightness in the air of the way mm -hmm. you tell a story, coupled with the fact that I don't think that associations and companies, I think their customer service is going to have to be providing really great networking opportunities. I think it's more than data once we get back together. Right. And I think yeah. you said it at the top of the hour, the same things that were important before all of this. Mm -hmm. they're, they were important then and they're important now. The differences, I think they've been magnified. I think where our true needs are, right? We know about the hierarchy of needs. When we get past the basics, we start looking and by industry, what do you really need right now? And is that what you're selling to your people? And, and uh, I think that's an important thing. And your audience tells you what they need. Audience or customer, whatever, they're telling mm -hmm. you exactly what they need. I think this has been a great way to wrap up our first week of the webinar talk show. We've had a lovely flow throughout because we really have been talking about 
how do we serve the people that we need to serve in great ways and how do we prepare for what's coming next? So, oh my goodness, Lori. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we Thank talked a little today. longer than 20 minutes. <laughs> I told ya. <laughs> and we only just barely scratched the surface, but I I'm sure know. those listening will will appreciate our brevity. <laughs> well, <laughs> and we'll listen, I really- No, go ahead, Tom. Eliz and I really believe that through conversation is is a great way to get engagement and education mm -hmm. that we don't just have to have a talking head in webinars. We can, we can do these interviews and we can do this chit chat amongst friends and really be able to share with an audience something that is both fun, entertaining, and as you proved today, Lori, super valuable. Good. Super valuable. Couldn't agree Absolutely. more. And, in, and a healthy debate is always interesting. I'd like to see a show where you have two people that are exact opposites of each other. Point, counterpoint. I'm waiting for that show. Let's bring it Ooh. on. All right. That's a challenge. I wrote that we'll down. We'll accept that challenge. That sounds good. Well, as always, it's a fun. joy to be with you guys. If people need us, they can find us at my website, which is lauriguest.com. Everything we talked about today is there waiting for them. And uh, I'm glad you guys are doing this because your customers need it too. So thank you. Absolutely. And just in case you're wondering, Lori is one of the most generous people in our industry and that I know. So when she says it's all there for you, it really is. There's a <laughs> lot there. <laughs> Thank you guys. I appreciate it. So we'll see you next week starting on Monday at 11 Central Time. Thanks for joining us for the webinar talk show. See you then. Tell your friends. <laughs>